two minutes to uh, give your comments. Um, if you would like to submit some documents to this committee, you can officially submit them for the record. Uh, sometimes uh, it appears that this is your first time before one of our committees. Yes, it is. So I just want to let you know if you do run over the two minutes, we do give you a little bit of flexibility to, to finish your thought. If you happen to have your uh, your talking points written down, you can, in addition to that, introduce them to this committee as part of the record as well. Okay, so you have two minutes, uh, Mr. Wirtz, to uh, make your comments. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think the most uh, uh, time efficient way uh, to handle this would to read a letter to a, uh, a gentleman who uh, is in, lives in Beverly Hills and owns a uh, property uh, in the Hollywood Hills, which is advertised as a, quote, party house, unquote. And his name is Mr. Rouhani. And um, while I'm sitting here with uh, Mr. Paul Rosenberg, um, I'd like you to envision uh, that there's actually 120 of us sitting in this seat right here. And uh, when we talk to the 120 of us, they all have two or three more people that are uh, equally upset about this situation. And I'll uh, read a uh, cease and desist letter that we wrote to Mr. Rouhani dated November 11th. Dear Mr. Rouhani, this letter is written to you with the 100 percent support of many of your neighbors to demand that you cease and desist from your repeated violations of Los Angeles city zoning ordinances, operating a business without a license, committing a public nuisance, and preventing the owners of adjacent properties to yours of having the quiet enjoyment of their properties. Besides the noise, loud music, strewn rubbish, traffic jams from the businesses from the buses bringing hundreds of party goers to the residentially zoned premises, delivery trucks, the smell of portable toilets, which incidentally uh, fall over now and then and run down our streets. Uh, emergency vehicles such as fire trucks, ambulances, and even police cars cannot access our neighborhood during your illegal commercial events. While your your clients, while your clients, that is people he rents the house to, put up no smoking signs when you lease them your premises, we have numerous pictures of party goers ignoring these signs. Indeed, we have witnessed the very dangerous practice of party goers flicking cigarettes from the balcony onto the dry brush of the hillside, putting your own property in jeopardy of fire. We have photographs graphic evidence of all affirmation violations as well as sound recordings of loud noise, loud music, and even a PA announcer. Most kindly note, most kindly note that a recent uh, that recently a city located within Los Angeles County brought charges of zoning violations, committing a public nuisance and operating a business without a license against a private resident owner doing exactly what you have been doing at 2321 Castilian. And this owner now potentially faces two years in jail and a $4,000 fine, according to a recent Los Angeles Time Times article. Further, in the city of Beverly Hills, upset neighbors grouped together to address the zoning violator such as yourself, and the violator was arrested. In the event that you choose to ignore our appeal to cease and desist in your illegal activities, our intention is to seek to apply the fullest extent of the law. We will reinstate a, a lawsuit, which we had previously, and, and bring the, this matter with all speed and haste to a court of law. This final paragraph. If you choose to exercise poor judgment and question our resolve, most kindly consider that our properties are decreased in value due to your public nuisance, noise, and noncompliance with residential zoning laws. Every adjacent homeowner by law must disclose to a potential buyer of his residence his knowledge of your repeated violations prior to a sale. Mr. Wirtz? Yes. Can you finish your thought? Like I said, you're more than welcome to submit it uh, for the record okay. as well. Um, as such, the involuntary transfer of the value of the adjacent homeowner's assets into your bank account against our consent will be met with the stiffest resistance, and it's signed by about 30 of the residents adjoining this property. And I will submit this letter to you Please. Okay. To, for your review. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Uh, Dr. Clyde Williams? <coughs> Dr. Williams? Okay. Did you want to speak, sir? Okay, if you did, just fill out a card. I'll give you two minutes, but you're okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Right. Okay. Um, is there anybody else to make public comment here to make public comment on item number seven? Public comment is now open on item number seven. Yeah, can I get a photocopy? Can I, can I get a yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, we're on item number seven, and public comment is open on item number seven. Seeing and hearing no one else come forward on item number seven for public comment. Public comment is now closed on item number seven. Um, it appears that on October 30th, the Planning and Land Use Management Committee uh, considered this motion 
and amended it by requesting that the LAPD, LA Fire Department, Building and Safety, and the Planning Department report back on feasibility of placing a cap on the number of allowable large social events in the Mountain Fire District areas in conjunction with a policy to allow a greater number of events with the condition that neighbors in the close vicinity approve the request. I would also move that report back request forward to include the City Attorney's Office. I would imagine because of the laws being what they are in this country when it comes to real property, especially people's primary residence, there's a term called your home is your castle, and that is the part of the way in which people's principal residence are treated in this country. So I would imagine that the City Attorney's Office would have to weigh in on the feasibility of requiring such limits by a motion of the City Council of Los Angeles. So with that, we'll concur with the requested report back from those various departments, including the City Attorney, as was stated in the Planning Land Use Management Committee. Is there anybody here from any of those departments that would like to make any clarifications at this time? Okay. With that, hold on, sir. Michael, does anybody have a reference as to by when they were expected to bring back that report back? Okay. All right. So then we'll concur with the report back timeline that the Planning Land Use Management Committee had requested. Okay. So with that, that's the action of this committee on item number seven. Okay. We now move to item number eight. Item eight, motion Han Smith relative to the replacement of Los Angeles Conservation Corps with the Watts Labor Community Action Committee as a provider of gang prevention services in the Watts Southeast Gang Reduction and Youth Development Zone for the period December 1, 2009 through June 30, 2010. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. I'm sorry, your name for the record. I can see you. I know you. Yes. But you're recording it audibly. For the record, my name is Guillermo Cespedes, Director of the Office of Gang Reduction and Youth Development. And if you will allow me, I will just kind of set the context for the programmatic context for this. In June of 2009, the Los Angeles Conservation Court was awarded a contract to provide prevention services in the Southeast Watts Grid Zone. That contract was awarded from January 9th, I mean January 2009 to June 2009. It was later extended for six months to provide the same services. And then on October 1st, we came back to council to make sure that all of the contracts were aligned with the fiscal cycle of the city. On November 6th of 2009, we received a notice from Los Angeles Council. Excuse me. You just referenced the alignment. So the alignment was that all of those contracts were approved to go through the date of June 30th, 2010, correct? Correct, sir. Okay. Go ahead. Correct. So on November 6th, we received a notice from the Los Angeles Conservation Corps that they were relinquishing their contract and their responsibilities with the city. We had several discussions and made transition plans and agreed upon those plans. So at this time, we're requesting authority to contract with the Watts Labor Community Action Committee as the gang prevention contractor for the Southeast Watts Grid Zone, effective December 5th. In order to minimize the gap in prevention services in the area, we're requesting to end the contract with Los Angeles Conservation Corps on November 30th and start the contract with the WLCAC. To commence it on November, on March, on December 5th or December 1st? Well, effective December 1st. Okay. So basically, you're apprising this committee that December 5th would not be the effective date, but December 1st would be the effective date, 2009? That is correct. Okay. Now, why? And so that we don't have a gap, but there would be a five-day gap if we did it on December 5th. Okay. Why we're choosing this agency, number one, they were the second-place finisher in the RFP process back in June of 2009, and those results are valid for three years. The other issue has to do with the fact that WLCAC is the non-grid contractor for the Watts Southeast area. So we are proposing that by having the Watts Labor Community Action Committee take on this contract, it would provide a more unique 
and comprehensive sets of, you know, set of services that would include both the non-grid and the grid zone in Watts. Um, so those, those areas are adjacent to each other, correct? They are adjacent to each other, sir. Um, we have had preliminary discussions with um, the Watts Labor Community Action Committee and have agreed on the programmatic components um, that will be explored to make sure that those adjacent areas are covered both with prevention and intervention services. In essence, we're thinking of it as a super grid zone rather than a grid and a non-grid zone. Mm -hmm. um, and that is basically the, the extent of our request. Okay. Um, was there any um, um, thing relevant you might want to share with this committee as to why the LA Conservation Corps decided not to follow through with the, the contract that they had uh, agreed with the city? Well, I think the LA Conservation Corps, the type of services that we are requiring for the targeted prevention was a little bit outside the scope of what they normally do. Um, they um, initially had issues with, although they're an incredible agency, initially had issues with personnel, outreach. Um, there were several corrective actions put into place, the last one which involved meeting with me right after I took office. Um, and after, as a result of that meeting, they decided that they, in fact, were not able to meet the requirements that we were asking. Okay. So th they, they basically um, applied for it, they were granted it, and I guess when it came to the real-time activity, they started to realize it was a little bit more different than they had anticipated. Correct, sir. So it, it's, it's probably a kind of action without prejudice on either side. It's just something that they came to understand and they conveyed that understanding to your correct. office, correct? Correct. Okay, good, good. Because they do do good work. I mean, we all know them. And, awesome. Uh, but uh, I, I want to um, thank them for their honesty and their their integrity of making sure that um, they didn't just hang on to a contract because they got it, but the fact of the matter is that they were constantly evaluating themselves and the services that were required of them. And uh, I think it's a perfect example, Guillermo, uh, Mr. Cespedes, of the nature of how we as a city want all of our contractors, certainly our service contractors, to operate. It's not just about, I got a million dollar contract. It's more about, I am required and I am agreeing to, by contract, to provide specific services. And in that, uh, we will be evaluated, we will be ex uh, held accountable, etc. cetera. So uh, my, my hat's off to them for uh, understanding that and anticipating that and their honesty and, and uh, conveying to your office that perhaps they're not the best fit. Um, and again, I say that respectfully uh, and, and appreciatively uh, of all of you. Uh, my next question is, when it comes to the prevention uh, contractors um, in general, this is one of them uh, in, in this area, um, are, how are we doing or how are they doing when it comes to the stated goal of the number of constituents that the youth that they're mandated to serve or that is the, the goal number within each contract? Are you talking about citywide? Uh, yeah. Well, specifically this area, and and do we have any areas citywide that are actually meeting or exceeding the intended goal? And with all due respect, I understand this is a new paradigm. Mm -hmm. We are in a new phase. We didn't have these requirements uh, right. years ago, although right. for many, many years we were providing grid one, grid two contracts, and many other contracts by the city. So I understand that this is a new paradigm shift, but I'm, I, I'd like to uh, know at this time how we're doing with those goals. Well, I believe that um, all of our agencies are um, now post this initial period of um, learning to evaluate and learning the dimensions of the evaluation, um, and even more importantly, developing a model of practice that allows them to intervene with these risk factors. So we've been doing a lot of work specifically at that level, helping agencies develop that model of practice. Um, citywide, we are currently serving um, about 1,364 families um, as part of this program. Some agencies, of course, have a higher eligibility rate, meaning that they're more capable of identifying the youth um, most at risk. Um, for example, the Watts Labor Community Action Committee has like a 90% eligibility rate, wow. meaning that they're able to um, very effectively 
identify which youth um, are most at risk of gang joining. Initially, our projected um, numbers were somewhere around 35 to 40 percent eligibility rate. Um, we're close to a little bit under 50 percent um, across the board. Um, and of course, that varies from agencies to agencies. Community Bill, for example, has a 71 percent eligibility rate. So overall, we feel that our agencies are, in fact, getting a hold of this model of assessment. Um, that they're moving forward and that, that the step in this phase is to make sure that there is a cohesive model of practice that's um, implemented citywide. Have any of them, uh, what, what's the stated goal per area of the number of constituents? Uh, should they not max out per se, but? By the end of the year, 200 per client, per, per agency for the, the grid clients, 56 for the non-grid agencies. But uh, is it fair to, to say that um, the answer to the question of what direction are they going in, is each area improving and growing the number it, of constituents? It is improving. There are increasing both. The eligibility rate is increasing. Their ability to identify youth is increasing. Where I would say we're a little bit over 50 percent of our way there. And, and raw numbers, they're going up as well. Correct. Per area. Correct. Okay. So perhaps some of it is attributing it to a new system, growing pains, et cetera, and, and learning a new system. I believe it's attributed to a new system and to higher level of standard, you know, again, dating, um, referring back to Los Angeles Conservation Corps, an awesome agency with a very long history of working with youth, yet this idea of targeted prevention, meaning really identifying risk factors, it's a little bit out of their range. So I, I think we've, we've asked agencies to establish a new culture and a new way of evaluating. And, um, you know, that's been both challenging and um, it's moved agencies a little bit outside their comfort zone. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, we're on item number eight, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, at this time, I'll open it up for public comment on item number eight. Um, I do not see any public comment cards on item number eight. Is there anybody here from the public who'd like to comment on item number eight? Public comment on item number eight is now open for public comment. See no one come forward and no public comment cards having been filled out on item number eight. Public comment on item number eight is now closed. Uh, we've now been joined by Council Member Perry. Uh, Ms. Perry, do you have any questions on item eight? No. Okay. All right. Seeing no more questions from the committee, um, the action of the committee is to approve the motion and uh, it'll be a minority report from the committee. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. All right. So with that, um, uh, Clerk, uh, does that cover all the agendized yeah. items? Okay, that covers all the agendized items for this committee. Um, so with that, uh, is there anybody here for general public comment? We do ha appear to have a general public comment card, Dr. Clyde Williams. Dr. Clyde Williams, he must have been here earlier. He filled out two cards, but he's not present when we called his name. So with that, uh, seeing no more public comment cards for general public comment, is there anybody else here who would like to make general public comment to this committee? Okay, seeing no one come forward at this time, then general public comment to this committee is now closed. With that, that uh, concludes all the items on the agenda and all the business of this committee. Therefore, this committee is now adjourned. Yeah, I don't have, I don't have any